I says, Mr. Dear, have you seen the Quran? He says, no. I said, would you like to have a look at it? I said, Dear, have you got an English translation? I said, yes, sir. So I said, no. He says, I don't mind. So I had this same translation by Yusuf Ali, but it was in three volumes. You know, the paper was a bit rougher than this. So, you know, it was very bulky, so they divided into three parts, ten separas each. So I had it in three parts. Same Quran, page for page same, but very much bigger and bulkier. So it was in three parts. So between one couple I gave one part, between the second couple I gave another part, and the last volume I gave to my boss. I said, have a look, sir. So they opened the book. It's natural, inquisitive. Now. So he just opened the book and started looking. So I suggested to my boss, what I'm suggesting to you, my brothers and sisters, every night. Open the index. Look up the subject, Moses. If it was a Christian, I said, open the subject, Jesus. Look, he's a Jew. I said, open the subject, Moses. So he opened Moses. Beautiful references. Then I said, look, sir, why don't you look up exactly what it has to say? You know, these are only references. So he opened somewhere, he had a look, he opened somewhere else, I'm watching them. Then he looks up to me, he says, D Dad, this book is very funny. Hmm. I said, What is funny about it, sir? He said, Look, D Dad, this book is speaking in our favor. See, but you people are all against us. So I said, It is true, sir. I said, You see, sir, the Egyptians, you know, set hard tasks for your people. They killed your sons and kept your daughters alive. In that was also a bitter sting. Why were they keeping your daughters alive? You knew why they were keeping them alive. And they said, hard task for you. Build, making bricks without straw and what and what not. They enslaved you. A free people that went there, they enslaved you. So, and you people were a people of God. Believed in God. Those were all idol worshippers, the Egyptians. So God Almighty is telling us that the Egyptians have been unjust to your people. But today, sir, I said, you see, you have usurped our lands. He says, did that? how can you say that? <laughs> Palestine belongs to us. <laughs> so I said, how, sir? How, sir? How does Palestine belong to you? And he knew his Bible better than many of us know our Quran. So he started quoting from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 8. He says, and I will give unto thee, Allah bari ta'ala, speaking to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. Say, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, that's Palestine, for an everlasting possession, and I will be the God. Means I will see to it that you are protected. Says, God Almighty promised it to us. And this is how they have programmed the Christian world. This is the promise of God to the Jews. If they go against the Jew, they are going against God. Can't you see? Like zombies, everybody is being led like zombies into this. So my boss, in good faith, is telling me, he said, look, Palestine belongs to us. God promised it to us. So I said, excuse me, sir. You see, the Bible gives us a test. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, we are told that, and if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Suppose this was not given by God. Suppose God didn't utter those words about giving Palestine to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. How are we to know whether it was such a promise was made or it wasn't made? That the word Lord had not spoken. When a prophet speaketh, says the book of Deuteronomy, in the name of the Lord, in the name of God, if the thing follow not, if that thing doesn't happen, nor come to pass, that is the thing the Lord had not spoken. Because if Allah makes a promise, his promise is true, must come to pass. If the thing didn't happen, then that is the promise that was not made by Allah. But the Prophet had spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Now they believe that a Prophet can speak presumptuously on his own. We believe that a Prophet can't do that. He's only a mouthpiece of God. Whatever Allah puts into his heart and mind, only that he can utter, not what he feels like. But according to the Christian Bible and the Jewish Bible, the prophets can speak, shoot it off, you know, off the cuff, anything what they like. So I said, look, this is a test. Is it a valid test? He said, of course it's a valid test. I said, let's apply it. 
let us apply to this prophecy. It's a prophecy that Ibrahim was going to get the whole of Palestine, Canaan, for an everlasting position, him and his children. So I said, you see, sir, the day when Abraham died, it says in Genesis chapter 25, verses 9 and 10, and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in a cave. Buried Hazrat Ibrahim in a cave. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. There was Abraham buried. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. They were buried in the same place. What land? What he had purchased with hard cash. He got nothing for nothing. He paid for it, according to the Bible, your book. So in other words, he had nothing. And we are told that he didn't have enough land to rest his foot upon. Not one square foot of land he owned. What was given to him for nothing. This is what he had to buy with his sweated labor. Then in the book of Hebrews, for the Christians now, chapter 11, verse 13, this Hebrews, you know who? Again, Paul. Well, we, we use him. This Paul says, these all died in faith. All these prophets, you know, were given promises. Allah, you know, promised them the golden carrot dangled before them. He said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Not having received. They didn't receive it. Allah was dangling this carrot before them, like a donkey. You know, come, come, come. And they were being led. This is what Paul is telling us. But having seen them afar off, you see that golden carrot, donkey. Far, far. You keep on going for it. They received nothing. So I said, now, is it true, sir? Is it true that they didn't receive the promises? They got nothing. He got nothing. He was supposed to get the whole of Palestine for an everlasting possession. And he didn't own, not one square foot of land was given to him. Is it true? So, well, his book says so. So I said, therefore, this promise could not be of God. And the battle was over. A sincere man. Since Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna, among them there are good people, walk through humul fasikun. The majority of them are perverted transgressors. But there are good people. He said, No, I can see the point. He's my boss. But I didn't want to cut short the discussion. We wanted to pursue this further. So I said, You see, Mr. Beer, I am prepared to concede that God did make such a promise. As if Palestine belonged was my father's property. I'm prepared to give it to you, in other words. So I said, now, the prophecy is, I will give unto thee, means Abraham, and to thy seed after thee. I said, who is the seed of Abraham? She said, we, the Jews. I said, no, no, no doubt. You are the seed of Abraham, but are you the only seed? I said, you know, in the book of Genesis, the first book of your Torah, no less than 12 places, Ishmael, that's how they say it, Ishmael, is described as the son and seed of Abraham no less than 12 times. And as for Ishmael thy son, and as for Ishmael thy seed, it says 12 princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation because he is thy seed no less than 12 times. So I said, you see, sir, you know, you are the seed of Abraham, and the Arabs are also the seed of Abraham. Why can't you both live in peace and harmony as brothers instead of you lording it over them and kicking them out? He says, did that. You see, we had this country. You know, we possessed it under David and Solomon. So, they are entitled to it. So he said, how did you get it, sir? <coughs> you see, you went, came out of Egypt, 12 tribes, united people, under Joshua, united people. And you go into a village, that village chieftain. You know, they call them kings. You know, a little fellow with 500 people or 200 people living there in the village is a little king. Like the Bantus they have, you know, Nkosi, 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 everywhere, a little, little Nkosi. So they had these Palestinians, these Palestinians, they also had the little, little chiefs. So they went and knocked over one king, conquered him. You, know, you are tribes, united tribes, 12 tribes against one little fellow there. And in one day they killed 30 kings. Can you imagine? They conquered 30 different countries. Can you imagine? No, what they did was one village, another village, another village, they knocked hells into them. They, they didn't know that they were a nation. This guy is thinking his village is his country. He is not thinking that, look, those guys are coming along, let us unite and defend ourselves. No, 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 this is mine. He lost it. That guy thinks this is mine and he lost it. And they lost 30 countries in one day. 
30 kings, they killed the Jews. They killed 30 Jews. So I said, look, you knocked hell into the people because the people, they didn't know that they were a people. They didn't know that they were a nation. There's only one little shift and then another little shift and you knocked them over and you took the land by force. I said, if that entitles you to that country because your forefathers, David and Solomon, had it, then we would be entitled to, e, uh, for, to Spain. I said, you know, my forefathers ruled Spain for 800 years. 800 years, the Muslims, and we have, they go to there and see the, the monuments that my forefathers built. They're still there. If we had the power, can we go and reclaim Spain? He said, look, who built the Alhambra? You built it? My forefathers built it. So we go and claim it. I said, the Dutch, can they go back to Indonesia? He said, look, our forefathers ruled it for 300 years. The Portuguese, can they come back to Mozambique? They said, look, our forefathers ruled it for 500 years. Nonsense. But he says, D, Dad, we have it. It belongs to us. You know, we got it now. I said, right, how did you get it? Might is right. Is that is your principle? That by force of arms you took it away from the poor Arabs? If that entitles you to Palestine, then they have a right to take it back by force. Why are you complaining? If by force, if you are entitled, if justifies you taking away, possessing somebody else's property, then by force of arms they can reclaim it. What are you crying about? And the discussion went on for an hour. And this boss of mine with the other Jews, you know, they had sins. There's good hearted people among them, Allah says. So he says, you know, that we didn't know that the Arabs had a case. This is his confession. We didn't know. In other words, they program from childhood into believing that this is ours, this is ours, emotionally, this is ours. So anybody wants to defend his property, say, no, you have no right, you are, bar you are barbarians, you are thieves and brigands, you have stolen our land, so we have a right to repossess it. He says, do that, I want you to write this, and I will publish this in my Temple David magazine. It's a new synagogue of the reformed Jews in Durban. He was the editor of this Temple David magazine. He said, look, you write what you are telling. You write, and I will publish it for you. I said, Mr. Beer, you know, I can't write. And really, you know, the writing is very difficult for me. Talking is very easy. I like to talk. But writing, what a burden it is, I know. So I said, he said, no, no, read that. You write as you speak. And I will improve it for you. <laughs> I know he meant well. But we never came to that. What do you think happened the next day? From there on, in the firm? You expect me to be fired, no? No. From the day onwards, I have become Mr. Didat. <laughs> Previously, it's Didat, Didat. Now it's Mr. He comes in the morning and says, Good morning, Mr. Didat. He goes for lunch and says, Good afternoon, Mr. Didat. Good evening, Mr. Didat. Didat becomes Mr. Didat. Promotion. <laughs> so, in the firm, the other Jewish managers, this is the boss comes and tells him, Say, you know, this guy here, dispatch clerk. Dispatch clerk is a lowly job in a white firm. So you know this guy, yeah? Man, he made rings around us. Story continues in part two. So in the firm, the other Jewish managers, this is the boss comes and tells him, say, you know this guy here, dispatch clerk. Dispatch clerk is a lowly job in a white firm. So you know this guy, yeah? Man, he made rings around us. You see? So he must have shared it with the other Jewish managers in the firm. He says, the guy knows something, you see. So while walking through one of the departments, clothing department, and the manager of the clothing department, Mr. Baynard, another Jew, he calls me. I was wearing my white dust coat, furniture trade. He says, come here, I did that. I say, yes, sir. He says, you know, you made rings around Mr. Beer, I hear. But you know, you can't do that to me. He says, you know, as for Ishmael, Ishmael was a bastard. Look, this, this is how they, the, the brainwash program. As for Ishmael, Ishmael was a bastard, he says. You know, an Arab would have put a knife through him. <laughs> but we couldn't afford to do that. <laughs> so I said, Mr. Baynard, look, why don't you come home? We'll sit down and we'll talk. You know, bring your wife along and your friends will have meals together. I said, ah, you can't do to me what you did to Mr. Beer. I said, who's talking about doing anything? You come home. Hmm, not interested. And every time I get an opportunity, Mr. Baynard, I said, you know my wife? I told her, and she is looking forward to receiving you and your wife. Come home. Every time I said, look, Mr. Baynard, come. You know, 
We are waiting for you. So he was persuaded. He comes. Mr. and Mrs. Baynard, Mr. and Mrs. Peel, and Mr. Townsend, who was a backroom boy for the Full Gospel Church. Three Christians and two Jews. They come along. I, same treatment, same treatment, feed them well, take them to the masjid, bring them back. I said, now we have teas and samosas. So they're having teas and samosas. So I said, maybe now the guy softened. You know, the tea and samosa and our meals, you know, they're very good. It might have done the job. So I'm thinking. So I said, Mr. Baynard, you remember you told me in the, in the shop that Ishmael was a bastard. He said, of course. I said, you still stand for that? He said, of course. I thought the samosas had done the job, but it hadn't. <laughs> so I said, all right, Mr. Baynard, tell me now. According to the religion of your religion, Judaism, which is better for a man to marry his own sister and beget child by her, or marry a born woman, a slave woman, a negress, and beget child by, by, by such a woman? He said, no, 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 the negress is preferable. According to the religion of Judaism, instead of having your own sister as a wife, you rather have a slave woman, a negress, a born woman, because that is what they insinuate that Hajra, who was actually a princess of Egypt, but this rubbish, they say that she was a slave woman. It's all right, even a slave woman. Which is better as a wife, your sister or a slave woman, according to your religion? He said, no, the slave woman is preferable. <laughs> I said, you see, according to the laws of eugenics, inbreeding, which is better for you to have your own sister as a wife or you have a slave woman, a born woman, a negress? He said, no, the negress is preferable. I said, according to your common sense, which is preferable, your own sister or this negress? He said, no, the negress is preferable. It's very good. No, the answers are right, correct. I said, you see, Mr. Baynard, when Abraham and Sarah, husband and wife, when they went to Egypt, he says, and Abimelech, Abimelech, I'm quoting from Genesis chapter 20. You can check it up. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. See, he goes there, and uh, this Sarah was a beautiful Jewess, Hebrew woman, beautiful thing. So this king, you know, he's enamored, he wants her. And there is what is called the prerogative of kings. You know, in the olden days, you see, the king has a right to take anybody's wife or mother or daughter, anything he wants, hey, I want that woman. You can't say no, otherwise it can kill you. So he's asking Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to the Bible, say this beautiful woman, what is she to you? So Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to the Bible, he spoke a lie. He said, she's my sister. So if she's your sister, well, send her in to the haram. So he had to send her in. And things went wrong that night, you know, and the fellow couldn't come right with Sarah. We don't know what happened. But uh, next morning, he's frustrated and he's calling Ibrahim. Hazrat Ibrahim said, I mean, ask him, say, look, man, because of this woman, I had a sleepless night. Tell me, what is your connection with her? So he said, she's my wife. He said, why did you lie to me? Why didn't you tell me? I wouldn't have done anything like that. And Hazrat Ibrahim salam says, according to Genesis chapter 20, verse 12, he said, and yet indeed, means without doubt, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father but not the daughter of my mother. It's different mother, but the, it's the father's seed. And she became my wife. So she is Abraham's sister. Seed coming from the same father. And you said, according to Judaism, according to eugenics, according to common sense, that the negress was preferable. And you say Ishmael is a bastard because he's a child of, Ish of, of, of Hagar, through Hagar, a slave woman. So I said, if Ishmael is a bastard, then Isaac is a greater bastard, according to your standards. <laughs> Look, you have a right to speak like that. We dare not speak about the prophets of God. Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam, he was a prophet of God. Hazrat Ishaq alayhi salam was a prophet of God. But now you're arguing with the sick mentality. You've got to get rid of the sickness. You've got to give it to him with a sledgehammer. When it needs a sledgehammer, nothing else will work. If you say, my man, my hero is what you say, then yours is worse. Any standard. Hmm. During the question and answer session, 
Alright. <coughs> can take her as wife and the God Almighty says that your bear woman that can't bear a child she will bear a son to you which one will you accept? I think what uh, young John has in mind is this that Sarah the wife of Hazrat Ibrahim salam, she couldn't bear any children no children. So, you know, getting old, Hazrat Ibrahim is getting old, Sarah is getting old, everybody's talking about she's barren, she's barren, she's barren. It's a disgraceful thing among the Eastern people not having a child. So she says, look, go unto Hagar, Hajra, and beget child by her. Now, this is how weddings took place. You know, there were no ceremonies going to court before the magistrate, and then he reads out a formula to you, and then he gives you a certificate. No. My daughter, you see all the prophets, when they went, he got the wife, he said, look, he said, oh, take her to wife. That means it's yours. And he's his wife. Only man who has a right to her is that person to whom the woman is given. Hajra was supposed to have inherited, uh, ha Sarah is supposed to have been given this Hajra as her maid. And she says, look, here, have her. And Hazrat Ibrahim a man of God, a friend of God. Would we say that he was committing adultery with her? If he was, God Almighty would have reprimanded him. No. His friend, Khalilullah, the friend of God, everybody says, the Jew says, the father Abraham, the Christians say, father Abraham, Muslims say, father Abraham. This father of ours committing adultery? Can we ever think like that? Can we ever talk like that? Hmm? So he goes unto her, and she begets a child. Now when she begets a child, for 13 years, there was no question about an offer being made. He said, look, do you want to do this one or that one? There was no question because the woman is not getting it. Sarah is not getting any children. And for 13 more years, she didn't have anything. 13 years. Hazrat Ismail was the only son and seed of Abraham for 13 years. After 13 years, Allah wants to also bless Sarah. And so he, she also gets a child and his name was Ishaq. So what is the problem? If God Almighty, according to the Bible, he says, and as for Ishmael, Ishmael thy son, and as for Ishmael thy seed, if you believe that this is the word of God, then God is saying, Ishmael your son. If God accepts, who the hell are you? Or any monkey, you know, to take says, no, he's not his son. What right has anybody to come along and deny him that right? If I married a Bushman woman or a Hottentot woman and she gave birth to a child, I accept that child as my child. What right have you to say that's not my child? I ask you. Have you any right? So on the standard, <laughs> the Jewish standard, he said, look, you think that Sarah is the legitimate wife and this is the illegitimate wife? I said, look, even then, your progeny in which Jesus came is a rotten a rotten progeny than that of Ismail on the standard that you are giving. We are not creating the standards. These are not our standards. These are the standards as we are. You judge, and Jesus told you. He says, judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, ye shall be measured unto you. He says, you hypocrite. He says, why seest thou the beam in thy brother's eye, and seest not the moat in thy own eye? So first remove. The more from thy own eye before wanting to remove from your brother's eye. Yes, you must heed that warning. Heed that warning that before you point a finger, think twice. This man, the Jew, didn't think twice. So he got into a mess. We must think twice before we open our mouth. What do you say? How do you judge other people?